Is that me? I think so. Oh, right. Yes, I've heard of yeah. him, undoubtedly. Um, so you started your recording career at Psalm, it says here, um, but clearly you're a bit of a musician as well, and I assume that came first, did it? Did you start playing yes. instruments when you were a little yeah, boy? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I started playing, um, I had classical guitar lessons at the age of about nine or ten. All oh, right. And um, failed miserably at all of them, mm. I think. Um, and then I think my guitar teacher was always more interested in my mother's legs than he was actually in teaching me. <laughs> she was, um, and then piano lessons at school again was never a very good. I think my you piano didn't practice lesson, much then. No. Yeah. No, 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 no. How come it's so no. good now then? <laughs> um, I've practiced a lot since. Have you? Because <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I, I mean, you know, we we met in about 1987, and yes. you were a jobbing, very busy and very successful engineer. Mm. And I mean, certainly, you know, when I was uh, being not quite as successful, being a, a jobbing engineer, um, I wouldn't have had time to pick up an instrument hardly ever. So, did well, you manage to keep it going through all those years? Or well, I was it? in bands. When I was in my teens, I was mm. in bands. Yeah. Um, I, I played, um, mostly played guitar and sang. Mm. Uh, and then, at a certain point, switched to bass when I was about 16, I think, or 17. Right. Uh, I mean, the bands were terrible. Yes. Absolutely of course. <laughs> um, shocking. And fortunately, I really don't have any recordings of them anymore. <laughs> um, but then what happened was, you see, I, I, I was in one band. Well, actually, no, I was in five bands at the same time. So yeah. you, you must have been pretty good then. So Which was in that much demand. Um, I'll get back to you on that. And <laughs> but we... We had the, I was in. I, I did, you know, guitar, rhythm guitar in one band, and played bass in another band, and sang in another band, and Excellent. played lead in another. One, you know, I mean, Variety. the only reason I played lead guitar yeah. was because I had a big muff. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. wish to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Fuzz pedal for all of you who don't know what a big muff is. And um, <laughs> I didn't used to be known as Stephanie or anything, you know. but um, that. That you know, if you had a fuzz pedal, you played lead guitar yeah. because nobody else had a fuzz pedal. No, so you know yeah. that was that was it. You, mm -hmm. were, you were the lead guitar player, mm -hmm. and also it was it was the time of punk, really. Yeah. You know, around then. So yeah. um, uh, didn't really matter whether you could play or not. It just meant that you know, if you were brave enough to get onto the stage, then it was okay. Yeah. So we we decided as a group of like eight local bands mm. that we wanted to make a recording. All right. And we went into, so I said, look, why don't we just get all the best bits of gear from all the different bands, mm. like the best amps, best drum kit. Mm. Let's book into a studio for a weekend, a 16 track, mm -hmm. and record it and just get all the bands to come through. So yeah. we'll have one day of all the bands coming through, just set the gear up and then everybody just walk in, play their songs, go, next band comes in. What a great idea. Two songs each. And then the next day, It'll get mixed, and that'll be it. And then we'll we'll make cassettes, and we'll sell the right. cassettes in the local record shop. Did you know anybody who'd done that, or no? Who, so no, it, was it, was just, a... it was just my sort of invention. Because I was very lucky that in the when I, you know, I was born in '62. Mm -hmm. So when it got to about late '60s, early '70s, it's when compact cassette first appeared, mm. which I think was sort of 1970, 71, mm. sometime around then. And that's when the Music Centre arrived. Yeah. yeah. I know if you, for those of you who are oh, not old enough to know what a Music Centre was, a Music Centre was just a large, normally normally covered in fake teak, yeah. uh, record deck, uh, there'd be a, a, a tuner, radio tuner in there, and there'd be a cassette deck. Yeah. And you could copy from the record deck onto the cassette deck. But of course, up until then, anybody who would wanted to be able to tape anything at home had had to have a reel-to-reel -reel machine. Mm. And, you know, there were lots of domestic reel-to-reel -reel machines in those days, like mm. Elizabethans and True Voxes and those things. So as people started to get rid of them, this was kind of my obsession. I yeah. loved recording things yeah. as a kid. Right. And so people used to give me their old tape reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. So my bedroom was full of old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. I wish I had some of them still now. Yeah. I mean, particularly my old True Vox, which was a fucking great sounding thing. Yeah. And I started to build pickups because I had this 
my 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 mum bought me an acoustic guitar when I was eight, so that would have been in 1970. Mm. And it was a Romanian acoustic guitar. I think it was I think it was Romanian. Nice. And um, in fact, I've still got it. Do you want to see it? Go on then. Go on. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it. We'll have to do an interview about studios in a minute, but um, yeah. But this is great. <laughs> There it is. It's because wow. of this. This is the reason. That looks like something John Lennon had in 1954 or something. This is the reason <laughs> that I got into music. This is exactly this. It's That's called super. a Kansas, made in Romania. It came from a catalogue and it cost, I think, the princely sum of probably a, probably a tenner, actually. Wow. Which then would have been, you know. Mm. And it was awful. Mm. It didn't play in tune. No. Um, the frets were all in the wrong position. At some point, I took all the frets out of it and used it for bottleneck. And I still yeah. use it occasionally now if I want something that sounds like a Dobro. Right. Because it actually sounds like a Dobro if you mm. press load on it. But anyway, that's it. Superb. Um, <laughs> I, built, I built pickups for it. I see. And then I used to plug right. the pickups. Oh, I, 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 the first thing I had was a World War set of World War II headphones. Oh, right, I see, yeah. And I just took, I took one of the earpieces yeah. and I glued it onto the top of the guitar mm. And then just took a cable out of that and plugged it into. How did you know how to do this? How, where did you get that idea I from? Just, 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 I knew how to do it instinctively. It was just yeah. instinctive, you know. And then I plugged that into. Used to run that into the crystal mic input because mm. in those days, a lot of those tape recorders used to have two microphone inputs. Mm -hmm. One would have been for probably a you know a really sophisticated carbon microphone, mm. and the other ones would have been for crystal microphones, which mm. had an even lower output. Yeah. And so I used to plug it into that, and of course it just used to overload it. And to me, I thought I was Jimi Hendrix. You yeah. know, it was just fantastic. Yeah. You know, I had just had this the, the distortion that came out <laughs> of that preamp, this old valve yeah. machine, was just astonishing. Yeah. And that was it, I was off. Yeah. I ended up with seven of these reel-to-reel -reel machines in my room. <laughs> um, I taught myself how to edit All right. um, by using sellotape. <laughs> yeah. um, and recording the BBC News. Yeah. So I used to record the news off the radio and then I would do things like I used to get the speeches of Idi Amin. I was particularly keen on the speeches of Idi Amin, yeah? <laughs> um, because he was such a nutter. Mm. And I, there was something about the sound of his voice mm. and something that I really, I, 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 and I used to basically... He was, he was sort of the Gaddafi of his day, wasn't he? Yeah, and I used to sort of get him to admit that he'd actually been murdering everybody mm. just mm. by editing stuff around. So yeah. I got into this whole thing of how to, how to you know, I started by making sort of these sort of little joke tapes for friends. Yeah. Where I would just get, you know, news broadcasters right, right. and make them say stupid things. Yeah. You know, it's a very childish thing to do, which um, That's very if popular. I had the time, I would probably still be doing it. Yeah. And then, you know, I got into, I, eventually I ended up with, with tape loops. I started to make tape loops. Um, and um, I had, at one point, I realised that you could fit a switch onto the erase heads so you could switch them on and off. Ah, yeah. you see, I, I, yeah, but, but as far as I got with that, I was trying to put bits of plastic in front of them. Mm, <laughs> no, well, there was just, I wasn't clever enough to work out how you could turn them well, on. Well, there was a wire, yeah. and so I just thought, well, if I fit a switch in line with the bit of wire, then obviously Genius. I can switch that thing off, you yeah. know. So I got into being out, I had some of the, I had three of my machines had, had switchable, right. um, had switchable erase heads. And I built a little passive mixer and had the three machines connected with a tape loop. Mm. So I had one tape loop that went around all three machines um, and then could mix stuff back. And I worked out how to feed back stuff and to set into the loop and turn it to all this kind of sort of weird long echo stuff. Mm. And this was all at seven and a half inches a second. Yeah. So it was yeah. like, you know, it was, which was super high quality at oh, that yes. point because you know, the, the other speed was three and three quarters. Mm. You know. And I would sit there for hours with this guitar, you know, with this, with this blooming mm. World War II headphones sort of glued onto the front of it there, <laughs> um, strumming away and making these kind of huge sort of soundscapes that just sort of grew and grew and grew, which of course, later, years later, I saw Robert Fripp doing it yes. with two Revoxes yeah. and I thought, you bastard, you nicked my idea. <laughs> um, but... Um, Mm. Yeah, and that's how I kind of, I was into all of that yeah. stuff. So, so how did this lead to you getting a job in a studio? What happened? Well, I just thought, well, you know, if I can't, if all I'm going to do is throw up every time I go on stage, mm. um, and I want to do something in music, then mm. the only thing for me to do is to go into the studio, and there was a real fascination for me with that. Mm. 
you know, that was. So how did you actually practically go about achieving that, though? What did you do? Well, I left school in. Ooh, would have been summer '81. No, summer 1980. Mm -hmm. I left school, mm -hmm. and I worked in. My uncle had a company, had a had a had a contract cleaning company in the south right. of England, and, and I was supposed to go and join the company and become part of that. And mm -hmm. So I went down and I lived with him for six months, and and I just you know cleaning things just. As you can see from my studio, cleaning things is not something I'm really big on. You know. oh, well, you've cleaned some guitars, you've been telling us about. Over the years, yeah. But, <laughs> but I mean, that's because that's, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so... You've got those skills, anyway. Yeah, and so I kind of... I got a... I got a you know, I, it wasn't for me. Yeah. It wasn't for me. And, and I, I, I had this real kind of urge to get mm. into the studio. Mm. And so, through a friend of the family, um, there was a... A friend of the family had a cousin, was a guy called Kevin Ead. Who was a publisher, music publisher? Mm -hmm. So E A D E. I think E A D E. Yeah. Mm. And um, she called him up and said, "Oh, this is you know kid I know who really wants to get into studios." And he said, "Right, send him up. Send him up to me." So I went up and had. He, he was a very nice man. He took me out for lunch. And he said to me, "You really don't want to do this." <laughs> he said, "You're mad." He said, "You really, really don't want to do this." He said, "Your life will be hell." <laughs> And he said, it's a terrible life in the recording studio. He said, you work and work and work and work and work. You've no social life. It's, it's very in, un, insecure. It's, it's, you know, if you really want to do it, you've got to be absolutely dedicated. But if you really do want to do it, this is the APRS list of studios in oh, London. Brilliant. Um, with all the telephone numbers. Mm. He said, I've copied that for you. Wow. He said, there you go. He said, but it also it will take you months. Mm. You know, you'll have to write letters, you'll have to keep calling them, and just keep, you know, he said, you've really got to be persistent. Mm. So I thought, okay. I went home. I thought, no, I really want to do it. I really want to mm -hmm. do it. So I got on the phone. I just sat there and picked up the phone and started to call. And I went down, you know, so I would have started, I suppose, Abbey Road would have been first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was alphabetical. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was no, 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 send us a CV, and all the rest of it. And I got to Psalm, and the receptionist went, oh, hang on a minute. Uh, hang on, uh, just, can you just hold? So, you know. And then the voice came on the phone, which was Jill Sinclair. Right. And she said, um, where did you go to school? I thought, um, told her where I went to school. And she went, right, come for an interview tomorrow. Our assistant's just handed in his notice, and he'd had literally he'd gone in that lunchtime and yeah. handed in his notice. Yeah. And fortunately, there I was three and a half hours later calling up. And so instead of having to troll through obviously lists of CVs that they had mm. in, the, in on file, yeah. here was this person that was daft enough to actually want to work in a recording studio. And so I went in the next day, uh, lunchtime. Um, I went to the studio first, which was, of course, in those days it was only Sarm East. Yes, there was no Sarm basement. Yeah, it was the basement in, in, in Osborne Street. Mm. And um, the two engineers at the time were Julian Mendelssohn and Gary Langan. Yeah, Gary was chief engineer and Julian was the house engineer. Mm. Um, Gary wasn't there, but Julian was. And um, so I came and sat down next to Jules, and he said, "Right, what's that?" You know, he started pointing at bits of the desk, and I could tell him what bits of the desk were. I'd done PA work and stuff as well a little bit up until then with local bands and things. So yeah. I knew, I knew how mixing desks worked and what they were. And he asked me to explain what some of the things in the outboard rack were, and some of them I recognised, and some of them I didn't know. They were a bit kind of, you know, esoteric for me at that point. Yeah, I think. Any, any space station. <laughs> yeah, well, anything, anything beyond uh, anything, anything beyond a compressor. Yeah. And I didn't recognise half the compressors anyway. No. I mean, the only compressor I think I'd ever seen at that point. In time was it was a DBX one sixty, you know. Mm. So, um, and then he asked me. I remember him asking me. Um, this is the bit you have to edit out. Okay? <laughs> you may have to edit this bit out. He said to me, "Can you roll a joint?" George <laughs> <laughs> is watching this. He'll die. So, Can you roll a joint? I said, "Yep." Yeah. Go on then. He said, <laughs> "Threw it on the desk." Roll a joint. He called and then he said, "Right, you better go and see Jill." 
I mean, he smoked it, I didn't smoke it, because he said, you're not allowed to smoke him as the assistant here. You can only do it as an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> which was the house rule. It was actually yeah. the house rule. Fantastic. And um, which I continued the tradition of for many years afterwards mm. as well with all my assistants. Um, as I'm sure some of them have vouched on this very website. <laughs> um, and then he said, right, you better go and see Jill. So the office was across the street, so I had to go mm. walk across the street. And obviously in between me leaving the room and, and going across to the other side, he called Jill up and yeah. gone, he's all right, we'll add him. Yeah. Nothing to do with my technical ability, nothing to do with my personality. Um, and despite the fact that I was clearly a foot taller than him, which really he wasn't too keen on to no. begin with. Um, and uh, purely down probably to my joint rolling ability, um, got the job. So I walked into Jill's office. Jill used to have this trick as well. She had this thing where she had three dogs in the room. And you would sit down and the dogs would just go all over you. Mm. You know, just wild. They were lovely dogs, but... Mm. And I like dogs. Right. And I think that was the thing that really got, that, that, that clinched it really. I mean, she looked at me and went, oh yes, he can talk whilst patting dogs. He doesn't look afraid. You know, <laughs> that's good. See, I would, I would have failed all those tests. And, so, and so I just walked into the job. She said, right, when can you start? I said, now. She said, good, because my brother's coming in in a minute and he's doing a track for, um, you know, you know, you get all these guys, right? This is the thing, right? You, if you, sorry, I have to look at the camera while I'm doing this. Right, people lie to you. Right, people lie to you constantly about their first session, right? My first session was, oh yeah, well, you know, it was the Rolling Stones. Like hell it was. <laughs> Nobody ever, no studio at that time would have trusted anybody on anything other than either an in-house project, yeah? You wouldn't even get trusted on a jingle because you had to work quickly, mm. yeah? So it would have been something that people weren't too sure about. My first session was Marvin the Paranoid Android's first and probably only single okay <laughs> which was fantastic and it was a, it was it was actually a beautiful session to start with because it was produced by John Sinclair who was Jules Sinclair's brother John had a lovely man had a lovely sense of humor um, and a very interesting character in his own right mm. you know he'd done a lot mm. of things himself he was an actor he's, I think he's now a rabbi but um, he went through lots of, you know, record production, <laughs> musician, ended up being a rabbi. I, 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 I think it's, of course, it's the right career path, I tell you. <laughs> Believe me, because I, there are days when I wake up and I wish I was a rabbi too, I do. But um, he, um, it was, it was him. And now, it was, who was the guy who played Marvin the Paranoid Android in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? It was Stephen, and I can't remember his surname, fantastic actor. So, of course, he was there. Right. Douglas Adams was there. Wow. Yeah. Um, Richard O'Brien turned up. You know, Rocky Horror Show. Mm -hmm. um, Ann Dudley was playing keyboards. I can't remember who else was playing. I think they might have recorded. I think Ann came in to do some overdubs because they'd already done the backing track. It's not a very big control room, is it? So no. Say, no. You know, it's pretty tight. Yeah. I was just sitting there going like, this is just fantastic. Yeah. And of course, the thing that I think people don't appreciate maybe now so much, because everybody, you know, we've all got these blooming computers and, and was just, there was a big, it was, you know, it was a very small room. It mm. was a very small room with a very, very large Trident TSM desk in it. I mean, it was a 40 channel, 40 monitor desk. I mean, mm. you could only just squeeze round one end of the desk. It filled the room. Yeah. There was a rack of outboard gear, and then next door was the machine room with two 24-track machines and an old Studer TLS system that used to synchronise them together. And it smelt like a studio. Mm. And like all studios in those days in basements, bad lighting, and so almost everything was lit by the glow of the LEDs on the desk yeah. and these little flashing lights in the rack. And I just remember sitting there, almost crying with excitement, yeah. with joy, yeah. because I was in this room that smelt like—I mean, it smelt like my bloody bedroom because my bedroom was full of tape. Because my bedroom was full of tape machines, I had yeah. to do it. Um, and so, <laughs> it was just magical, mm. and you know, that's something that's never ever left me. Mm. Whenever I go to a studio. 
and I'm working, particularly when you get into the evening and the light, you know, if, if you do have windows, mm. um, as the light fades and, and you start to get that sort of slightly dimmer electric light in the room, mm. and if you're on a desk and there's that that slew of lights in front of you and, and, and meters bouncing, and the, I mean, that's just, it's just, that's that's heaven. Sod whether there's any music coming out of it. You know, there's a kind of there's a whole moment there for me whenever I see that, where yeah. I just I get I still get that surge of excitement that I had when I was 18 years old and walked through the door the first time, mm. Mm. and it's just and it never goes away, does it? No, it's just beautiful, mm. you know. And then there's people out there playing instruments mm. and there's music coming out of the speakers, and it's like you sit. I sit there sometimes, you know, through all the shit that we've been through in this business in the last 30 years. And I still have to pinch myself and go, oh, we're doing it, it's music, mm. you know, it's, it, that's the thing that I'm always looking for. And that's, the, the, you know, that's, that's such a wonderful, and I just have that memory of that. And that, but that was, that was it, the, the grim reality of everybody who started, especially in the, in the 70s and the 80s, was that was what you did. That was your first session would never have been something, you know, big. Mm. Except there's maybe one or two people who are telling the truth, but the rest of them are lying. I can mm. assure you, okay? Uh, but it doesn't. It doesn't matter because it's the experience of being in the room and, and doing those things that's important. Yeah. And of course, you know, there I was with 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 Douglas Adams. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think I you know, and I left the studio at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, mm. and from that moment, I don't think I had a day off until Christmas and I certainly worked Christmas Eve because mm. I remember getting home at two o'clock on Christmas morning um, and I started on the 30th of January and so I worked every day no weekends nothing <laughs> every single day 14 15 hours a day Julian and Gary there might be two sessions a day yeah and so they would one of them would do one session, one of them so would do the other session. So you were the only assistant? And right? I was the only assistant, so I would work all wow. the time. And I think it got to the point where I keeled over. Mm. Not surprised. Towards just after into the new year, just into the beginning of 82, I just keeled over at one point. I was, I was on, in fact, I remember where it was. It was with Gary. Gary was engineering. It was still with the Trident. And because it was the Trident, you had the tape remote for the, for the Studer. Mm -hmm. And because it was such a tiny control room, it was very difficult for me to sit next to Gary because mm. that's where the producer would be sitting normally. Mm. And so I would be sitting. I had this big, tall chair with like a big, tall sort of bar stool kind of thing, which I used to put on top of the sofa. <laughs> yeah. Because the sofa was in front, there was a well in front of the desk, but mm. there was a little sofa there. Yeah. So I used to put the, the chair onto the top of that, into the corner of the sofa. And I'd have the tape remote, which would put me at the right height to be on the back of the meter bridge, mm. on the back side of the desk, with the tape remote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd have the tape remote and I would be operating the tape machine from there. Because I mean Gary liked me to, to actually be a real tape. A tape off, yeah. yeah. And so I'd be doing all that and doing all the punch-ins and everything. And, and it was about one or two o'clock in the morning and I I keeled over. I just I just I just fell asleep and, and I I went right off onto the floor and I think you know they, from what Gary said at the time you know they they he ran round because obviously he saw me go and I just you know this chair just went off so obviously I was on a very high chair yeah. that went off the edge of the sofa yeah. and I, I hit the floor yeah. and I hit the floor with my ass sticking up in the air you know face down mm. um, slightly blooded my nose I didn't manage to do any more damage than that um, but didn't wake up and of course, I think you thought I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't really remember. I mean, I used to sleep on the sofa in the studio probably three or four nights a week because I lived in West London and the studio was in East London. So it was just by the time I tried to get back in the morning, I, I, I would only get three hours sleep. So I yeah. used to just sleep in the studio all the time. Mm. And I just remember coming to on the sofa. Um, and apparently the reason he said, you know, he said, I, I knew you were alive, he said, because I was trying to wake you up and sort of, you know, slapping your face and stuff. And you told me to F off and, 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 and rolled over and just carried on sleeping. Mm. He said, so we just left you, you know, so I slept. And I think at that point they decided, 
maybe we should get another assistant you know, in case this one dies. You know, so, um, and so they got a guy called Keith Finney. Um, Keith came uh, to work. Um, uh, he's a South African chap. He's, uh, he's uh, an old old friend still. And mm. He's back in South Africa. Has been for right. twenty years now. I think. Right. But, um, yeah, Keith came in, and then I started to. And then Gary left. I started to engineer. And then I, my first engineering job as. You know, full engineering mm. job. I'd cut my teeth really doing bits and pieces on because we were doing yes at that time, so mm. yes nine oh one two five. I did bits and pieces with the Buggles mm. second album, just occasional things. So a lot of it was with Trevor, was it? Yeah, some of it was with Trevor, um, and but just little bits and pieces mm. when the other guys couldn't make something or you know or, or, or they wanted to go home or they, yeah. you know and there was sort of you know stuff to be done or. The guitar player in the band wanted to work at two o'clock in the morning when everybody else was going. He'd be like, oh, Stuart will do that, it'll be fine, you know. And then a jingle session booked in, and we hadn't had any jingles for about three or four months. Mm. And um, Gary had left. Uh, Julian was still there, I think, at the time. Yeah, Julian would still have been the, the, the house engineer at the time. And I think Julian just went to Jill and went, He's ready, he's ready because it's like it's you know eight o'clock in the morning start, yeah. which means you have to be there at seven, yeah. you know, to get the jingle set up. You know. He's ready, it's great, you know. He's fine, he'll be great, you know. Let him do it, let him do it. <laughs> and so I was thrown into that, and I always remember it because it was bachelor's cup of soup. It was nobody makes soup in a cup like bachelor's cup of soup. That was it. it was on the radio longer than I think than any record I've ever made. Yeah. It just went on and on and on and on, and it was fantastic. Three hour session, uh, drums, bass, keyboards, guitar. Uh, then in came, I think, a string section, 14 piece, probably. Uh, then a brass section, and a 10 piece choir. <laughs> uh, recorded and mixed in two hours and 35 minutes. The last 25 minutes, the arranger had was trying to get a BBC series called Bomber Command. He was trying to get the theme for it, and he'd written this brass theme for Bomber Command. So he said, I couldn't just do a quick demo of this thing I written because the brass players are still here. And I went, yeah, sure, OK. You know, so off they went. They went back into the studio, they played this thing. I think he got the gig as well. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so we did that. That's That's... And I remember it was our receptionist's first day. Right. This poor girl was standing in reception, <laughs> and I thought she was. And you could see the look on her face was like, bloody hell, is it like this all the time? Because Sam East is tiny. You yeah. imagine all these people having to come in and out. And she was like standing there, like a, like a, pol a policeman, sort of you know trying to direct traffic. And yeah. It's like, oh, well, uh, are you brass? Yes, in there, please. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's not. You know, it's, it only goes to prove that a recording studio is not always loads of people sitting around in reception smoking joints and drinking cups no. of tea, is it? You know, so, uh, the thing, so of the things you of the, from those years of your education in in the studio business, what do you bring to what you do now? What's what's important that stayed with you? Well, I think the beauty of what I learned from them was the job is done when it's finished. You know, Gary, and it's the thing that I've always done. In fact, I don't even I don't even wear a watch anymore. Mm. Gary used to take his watch off. He used to take his watch off and put it somewhere. And it's something that I got into the habit of doing as well. I think yeah. I'm, so I'm pretty sure it was Gary that used to do that. Yeah. Um, but Julian too. I mean, they they just there wasn't a question of. Um, we have to finish it this time. Right. There wasn't a sen there wasn't a sense of. Um, oh my God, I'm really worried about the budget. Mm. There was a sense of, this is a piece of music, we are recording this and we're going to get it right. And if we have to spend a long time getting it right, we're going to spend a long time getting it right. Mm. Because Is that something that's that how Trevor in, engendered in those two, do you think? No, no, that's no, no, no. that existed, that's just something that existed. And that's, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, Trevor was, at uh, that time, incredibly extreme. Mm. Incredibly extreme. Yeah. Um, because for Trevor, the, the, there was no beginning. There, there was a beginning, but there was—I I think there wasn't. An end. <laughs> you know, I don't think there was an end. It no. was just—it was just he was chasing this dream. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and if you didn't follow the dream, you were in the way. Yeah. So you, know, you didn't, and I, and I, and and that sounds very harsh, mm. but I think it's true. But I absolutely respect him for it. Yeah. I absolutely respect it. I have of of all the producers that I've worked with. Um, I would say that he is the one who would never, ever, ever, ever let go. Mm. And bless him, because he, because he, look what he did. Mm. I mean, look what the man did. Mm. Look what the man did, and probably still continues to do. Mm. Um, just a, you know, this dogged kind of, you know, I will follow this path, mm. Mm. and. You know, I had a very strong impression a lot of the time they didn't really know what the path was. Mm. But he knew when he got there. Yeah. And that was the thing. And and because Gary and Julian particularly were so um, professional in their approach, mm. Mm. but also so talented. Mm. I mean, they, you know, they, those two, for me, those two engineers define that period of recording in a yeah. way in this country. You know, they, they were. Mm. I mean, Gary, Gary through his, I mean, I'll tell you an interesting thing about that, like, 90125, mm. just magnificent, mm. you know, because you're talking about analog recording, you're talking mm. about 24 track or 48 track, in fact, all the yes stuff was done 16 track block, you know, so 16 track 2 inch for the drums, mm. Mm. record the drums, put them away. Yeah. You know, make slaves, and then everything was done on 24 track slaves, and we had a lot. When we went from one studio to another, we used to take about 65, 70 reels of two inch with us. Yeah. yeah. We used to have a transit van full of tape, yeah. and that was my job. Good grief. Um, I used to, I was the one who knew, I can still tell you, I can still tell you which track certain things are recorded on, on which slave, <laughs> yeah, on track sheets from that project. I mean, I, that's how. It, ingrained in me that stuff was keeping yeah. the track sheets Gary was a, and Julian were both real sticklers for keeping the track sheets accurate yeah. yeah and so we took notes we took a lot of notes mm. and track sheets are you know they were they were they were always beautiful they were works of art if mm. they weren't a work of art then you had to redo them mm. you know mm. well presumably they got redone fairly regularly yeah they did as we were over changing, changing yeah. yeah and um but it was the quality of what went on to the tapes mm. that used to astound me. Mm. And Owner of a Lonely Heart, mm. um, the guitar solo on Owner of a Lonely Heart, if you remember, is the thing with the fifth harmonizer. It's yeah. the fifth harmonizer on it, mm. yeah. Um, was Trevor Raven and I were messing around with his guitar rig in mm. the studio yeah. area. And he played that mm -hmm. with the fifth harmonizer on it. Yeah. And I said, that sounds really cool. You know, yeah. Because I'd never yeah. heard that before. It yeah. was like a really go. Kind of... And he was like, well, I said, that sounds really cool, you know. And then of course Trevor Horn hurt. I said, I said, leave that on. Yeah. And and play it to the, you know, play it to the boss. Yeah. And of course Trevor Horn heard it and went, Oh, I love that. That's great, you know. And so I always remember that moment, because yeah. like, that moment in the track is amazing. Oh, it is, yeah. And then, I don't, I, I've i seen interviews with Trevor where Trevor said it was him that used to do it, but I'm <laughs> bloody sure it was me. Yeah. Right. Sorry, Trev. Um, I used to fart around with the reverb on the solo and pan it around, because I'm... I'm a Hendrix junkie, yeah, right? Yeah. So I was always trying to work out how Hendrix, how how the, how the Hendrix solos and the out of phase stuff, mm, and all those things mm, were being done, you know. Mm. So I know that that's something that any given any opportunity, I would just jump onto the desk and do that with anything, mm. you know. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was me that started messing around like that to mm. start with. And I know Trevor loved it. Mm. And then it got to Christmas time, and Trevor said to Gary. Could you rough mix all the record, please? We weren't finished. Some of the tracks were finished, some weren't. Owner of a Lonely Heart was already finished, the recording mm. of it was finished. Right, right. But some of the other stuff was still. I want everybody to have a really good cassette mm. of where we're at. Mm. So we spent two days, just Gary and I, spent mm. two days doing rough mixes. 
and um, so it would have been I think still on the Trident mm. it might have been the SSL by then but I remember that we did them manually mm. Mm. yeah so maybe Gary would have put a tiny bit of monitor EQ or a mm. tiny bit of compression mm. or maybe if it was on the SSL I can't quite remember whether it was the SSL or the, or the, or the, or the, or the, um, the Trident but if it was the SSL there would have been a bit of mm. or compressor on there yeah um, but basically they were flat mm. yeah mm. we did a version of owner and only heart he said right I ended up with the faders that were doing the, amongst other things the guitar so yeah. I went like an idiot like I always did yeah. with it. and he went oh yeah it's alright and then he did this amazing thing which I always love on that track you know there's that moment after it's gone through all of that kind mm. of middle section, where suddenly there's like a cut and it yeah. goes into this guitar riff, just this clean guitar riff, yeah? yeah? Gary just said, that bit that comes after it, he said, I think it should just go straight into that. And so he just chopped the tape. <laughs> That's it. That's the thing, you know, it's like that really, and it's, it is, it, that is an idiot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's the track. That's the, that's the mix. That's it. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and that right. is that's interesting. The sound of Gary Langan's multi-track. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the sound of that multi-track. Yeah. I mean, those drums, mm. the kick and snare. When we recorded those, they were recorded in Sarm East. It was the bass drum and the snare drum tuned to A. Because the tune, the tune's in A. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it modulates between A, a minor in the verse and yeah. A major in the chorus. Yeah. yeah. So the whole thing's in A. The kick and the snare are strobo tunes to A. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the guy that used to look after the drum kit, Nuno uh, Whiting. Yeah. Mm. Lawrence, Lawrence Whiting, I think his name is. Yeah. Um, who was the, the sort of drum tech for the band? Right. Um, him. There was a guy called Richard who worked for the band as well, and Alan White. And, and Gary and me all in this kind of huddle around this drum kit for like hours and hours, I mean probably a day and a half or something, you know, trying to get this, this kind of tuning the bass drum and snare drum to A, you know, so that it would, it works man, you listen to that track. So it's a rough mix? And it's a rough mix, as well, it's a very good yeah, rough mix. Your, your manual, no automation? As far as, I, as far as my memory serves me right, well, it's, it's manual, well, that... no automation, and, the, but the thing about it really is, what I'm saying about Gary is, that's his multi-track yeah, sound. Yeah, that's the astonishing. sound of the multi-track. Yeah, the yeah, man yeah. knows how to record stuff. And that's yeah. the thing that I learned from him. That's really interesting. Because no, because I remember um, you know being really into the album and somebody saying, Oh, you should listen to this, George. Um, so it's um, on Owner of a Lonely Heart, you know that bit you're talking about where it goes to the guitar and there's no drums in that bit, and then mm. the drums come back in. Well, because mm. you know, we, it was the early days of having CDs, you know. You, just turn it up and hear simply code bleeding through on Chuck O'Khan tracks and things yeah. like that, you know. Yeah. And just before the drums come in, you hear the hiss start on the drum tracks mm. if you listen on a CD dead loud. Yeah. So, which clearly was a, a manual mixing thing. Yeah. yeah if yeah, you yeah. did it unnecessarily, you'd make it cut, you know, you'd have your yeah, yeah, yeah. frame accurate yeah, you'd cut on your drums, that, wouldn't you? All that, all that poncy frame accurate cutting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or but what we do nowadays, which exactly, is yeah. you know, chop the audio. Yeah. Draw it, yeah. But you can you can hear the hiss on the drums oh, just yeah, yeah, about yeah. half a second before they come Would in. Would have been, shit, come the drums! You know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So clearly it was a manual mix, which explains oh, yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, 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 which yeah. kind of explains that, yeah. you know, because mm. I can't remember, it was one of the engineers at Livingston said, oh, yeah, a bit, bit, come on, Trev, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It's, a bit, it's a bit remiss, you know, not cutting it. And it's going to do it. And he goes, Exactly, but it's but you see the point of that as well is great record producer, right? Mm, mm. Great record producer because the great record producer then goes right. We're going to mix that, mm. and we must. I think they mixed. I think it was mixed a few times. Yeah. The track again yeah. after that. But they still he still had the vision to. And he still knew. Yeah. He came back to it and said, "That's the one. Yeah. That's the one that's great. Yeah. You know, and that's the genius of a great record producer mm. as well because the great record producer." has no ego no. around that stuff. Mm, mm. Now there's a lot of stuff been said, I've seen stuff on the internet and things about Trevor having this big ego about mm. this. Very wrong. Yeah. Trevor didn't have an ego about it. Trevor wasn't sitting there going me, 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 me. 
Trevor was searching for something fantastic mm. and he got something fantastic yeah. and he found the people who were capable of creating that fantastic thing with him. Mm. That's why he had a really close-knit team around him. That's why it was Gary, Julian, Steve Lipson, mm. you know, who's a fantastic engineer, Steve Lipson, and a great guitar player. Yeah, we, we know Steve Lipson. <laughs> We've interviewed him. And, um, and then musicians like Anne Dudley, yeah. you know, who is, I mean, you know, a, a goddess of modern recording, you yeah. know, and um, and Andy Richards, of course, mm. who mm. brilliant, brilliant keyboard player mm. and programmer, mm. and and that very tight knit group of people, you know, created lots of very, very interesting records. Yeah, and you know, Trevor would, you know, I mean, listen to Trevor's recorded output. Stylistically, he can he can style hop like nobody's business. Mm. Mm. You know, there was always this kind of thing of that. Yeah, well, I don't like all those producers that only have one sound. He never only had one sound. No. He had loads of great sounds. He just spent a long time honing them down so they mm. were perfect. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's the thing that I, from my psalm days, that's what I took out of my psalm days. I took right. out of my psalm days as saying, yeah, there are moments when the only thing you can do is put the hours in. Right. You've got to put the hours in. If you don't put it's the It's a slightly unhealthy in. way of living, though, isn't it? You know, it's you, shit. Yeah, because if you don't know what she's <laughs> suddenly resolved and have any dinner, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like the, 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 the classic one for me would I remember doing the, when we did the Band Aid single. Yeah. And um, because I suppose, I think the reason that, because that, what had happened was Geld off had, had, and, and Midgeur had started this track. And, you know, because I think we'd all seen we'd all seen that documentary mm. um, or we'd seen the news reports around that period of time and I mean it was, I, I, I'm sure you remember it mm. too, I mean it was horrendous, yeah. absolutely horrendous. And I think it was the first time really that one of those, I mean there'd been the Biafran thing mm. which had happened 10 or 12 years before that which is kind of in my consciousness as a younger child. Right. But I think for me, and certainly for our generation, that mm. was the first mm. moment when that we were really confronted with that as adults. Yeah. And, you know, bless Bob, he, he, he said, I want to do something about it. And, and fortunately, he's forthright, you know, he's a sort of forthright enough character that he decided he was going to do something about it. Mm. Um, and then they'd obviously called up Jill and said, could we get some free studio time. I think they called everybody in London and said, could mm. we have some free studio time? And I think most people had just gone, no. Mm. And Jill obviously <coughs> just said, yeah, sure, you can do it. Um, and I think they put me on the session because this is by the time we had Sam West and mm. you know, we'd built all the other studios. Yeah. And I was very much kind of entrenched as one of the main house engineers there at the time. Yeah. Um, and I think just because I was always the sort of fearless one yeah. Um, not to do with the fact that I'm really particularly brave or anything. Probably I'm just a little bit more stupid than everybody else and, and just didn't really realise what might go wrong. You yeah. know? So I was always prepared to kind of go that extra yard or two. Yeah. And so they said, you know, would you do it? And I went, yeah, all right. Not really thinking about what it would be. And then thinking, well, I better make some preparations for this. And so I started to make some telephone calls, spoke to people. And, mm. I forget the name of the engineer that used to work with Midge. Um, I forget his name. I spoke with him and he'd explained to me that it was on 24 track and we'd have to go 48 to do this and that Phil Collins was coming to play drums and there was going to be a few people turning up to sing and, you know. So I had this vision of sort of 20 people turning up to sing mm. and um, there was going to be a film crew and there were going to be some press photographers. Mm. So, okay, fine. I thought, because there's going to be a lot of people around, I decided that I would have two assistants. Yeah. I had two assistants, which were Hef Marais and Steve Reese. Um, and I remember getting in, it was Sunday. So it was Sunday morning, I got into the studio about 7.30 in the morning. Mm. And we got the tension machines lined up and started to do all that stuff. And by about 10 o'clock, the first singers started turning up. But these film crews kept arriving and there was like one film crew and then there was another there was guys from the tube were in the control room with us this is studio one at Sam West mm. so they were in the control room so they sat up on the other side of the desk from us and then there was 
another film crew arrived out in the main studio area and so we sort of accommodated them and I'd run all this time code and stuff out to, to, to various patch right. points in the room so that anybody could just sort of come and plug in. Yeah. yeah. And then more people turned up and then there were all these bloody singers turning up. There's like singers coming out of our ears. Hmm. I remember the, uh, the, and it was sort of 10 o'clock in the morning and Midge said, you know, we really need to get going, let's, let's start recording something. And by which point we had about 70 people in the studio area. <laughs> it's a big studio area. Yeah. But we had, you know, these paparazzi guys with their bloody ladders. I mean, they brought ladders. <laughs> you know, they were up ladders because they're always up. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that paparazzi, I don't think, yeah, they just don't feel good unless they've got a ladder, yeah. have they? Unless they feel like they're kind of some kind of peeping Tom moment. Yeah. And that's obviously what gets them <laughs> off. But yeah. Oh, it's, you know, I mean, I can understand it, you know, if they're trying to get um, all patches. So, you know, there's... And then the guy from Cool and the Gang turned up. Two guys from Cool and the Gang turned up, because they were on tour. And, and so they, they popped in, and someone had said, oh, you should come down. And so they'd come down, including JT, who was the singer of Cool of the Gang. Mm -hmm. And I always remember this conversation in the control room, because at that point I'd worked with Spandau and I'd worked with Duran Duran. And I think Simon Le Bon and Tony Hadley and I forget who else was there. I think Paul Young was there as well. Mm. At early. They had all turned up, you know, really early. And there was this conversation going on about who was gonna sing first. Mm. And then JT turned up and everybody stood in the room and went, oh, fuck, we're not singing in front of him, he's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was great. It's the cream of British pop at a yeah. particular moment in time. And as soon as they saw this great American soul singer walk into the room, they were like, oh, no, I don't think I want to sing in front of him. He's really good, you know. <laughs> Which I thought was incredibly charming, considering yeah. that they were the, they were the successful artists yeah. of the period, you know. Yeah. And eventually Tony went, OK, oh, I'll do it, all right. And so he was brave. He went out first. And everything that you see on the newsreel of them singing on mic is the take. Yeah. We didn't have time to pose for pictures. We had one moment, I think, where we had about half an hour of posing for pictures, mm. which look really obviously posed when you yeah. see them on the newsreel. Everything else is actually the recording. Mm. Um, and it was pandemonium. Mm. Absolute, utter pandemonium. But that's the thing, talking about not remembering to eat and do that mm. stuff. Was it, I remember getting to 10 o'clock in the evening and thinking... Jesus Christ, I need to go to the toilet. Mm. I hadn't been to the bloody loo all day. <laughs> and suddenly, and the room was completely full. I mean, it was, it was surrounded by them. That room had about 50 people in it. Yeah. You know, I mean, to, to move from the desk, you know, you had to sort of go, excuse me, excuse me. And I mean, I really was about to piss myself. <laughs> and I just went, right, fuck, you know, <laughs> ran out of the room. Fortunately, everybody managed to get out of my way. I just made it to the toilet in time. It was when I got to the toilet and I realised there was a hole in the door and I didn't quite understand why there was a hole in the toilet door until I discovered that's, that's the story that I was telling you before when we were at Living yeah. in, in 87, we were talking about it, um, was that all of Spandau Ballet were in the toilet at the same time and status quo managed to lock them in there mm. and they'd had to kick their way out. <laughs> um, and... Um, and we've never quite got to the bottom of why they were all in the toilet at the same time. But um, answers, please, on a postcard. <laughs> um, if, if, if there are such things as postcards, anybody else, email will do, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so uh, there was all that, you know, mm. sort of nonsense going on. And, and, and just realising that I hadn't eaten. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, um, and Simon Le Bon very kindly going, what do you mean you haven't eaten? I said, well, I haven't eaten. He said, well, good. And so he, had to, he went downstairs and uh, I think, I don't know if he actually made the sandwich or he just got, you know, managed to find someone who mm. had made, could make a sandwich. And, 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 but I remember him bringing me food and sort of oh. saying to me, but, but you've got to eat, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like, it's like having your mum there. It was yeah. great. And, um, because that's what, uh, Abba's engineers, you know, he didn't eat for 12 years or during all the making of all those Abba records. He didn't have lunch for 12 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, it keeps you slim, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> So that's why I'm not so successful. I, I, I demand lunch. <laughs>